first reaction when I got that question was, I think in the whole of my life, I've never had such a crazy question asked to me because uh, such a question, a question that, that rests on such an absurd assumption. Because every day, and that must happen to many of you in the room, every day I'm frustrated by the fact that I have only about 1,000 minutes that are usable during that day. Every morning I wake up, I have to force myself to stay long enough in bed because there are all these things I would like to do, I feel I have to do during my day. And so, um, why might people have the idea that a world may come in which there will be nothing left to do? And why would these people asked me to ask to answer that question and then it clicked it clicked and the answer has already just been hinted at yes i published this year a book uh, uh, under the title basic income um, a radical proposal for a free society and a sane economy um book was published in the United States uh, by Harvard. It's also, it's already in the process of being translated into a number of languages, including, I didn't know there was such a distinction, Chinese in complex characters and Chinese in simplified uh, characters. Um, the central idea in the book is, uh, or the book is really a plea, a systematic plea for uh, a very uh, a simple ID. But what might this ID have to do with the questions that we are being asked today? And I thought, well, probably the following. A number of people have been uh, arguing uh, for this ID um, on the basis of the following sort of argument, very sort of uh, schematically formulated. And among them, there were most recently Richard Branson, for example, or Mark uh, Zuckerberg, defending this idea of a universal or unconditional basic income. The idea was, and the part of the background has just been hinted at by Aisha, the idea was, well, we have uh, a new wave, or we expect a new wave of auto automation, uh, robotization, artificial intelligence, etc., uh, that is going to lead to a massive loss of jobs. Hmm? Uh, people who are doing sort of intelligent uh, work with their own brains will be replaced by these machines doing the work for them. Uh, truck drivers will be sacked in millions because uh, there will be all these self-driving uh, trucks, etc., etc. And so there will be more and more people with nothing left to do in the sense of with no job for them uh, left to do. That's the argument, and of course people may get worried about that because, uh, well, if uh, there is no job, there may be no food for these people either, and if there is no food, they'll starve, and worse still for some of these people, uh, they won't be able to buy the products which the robots are going to produce, so worse still, they may revolt at some point against the owners of the robots or the owners of the machines and uh, their friends. And so therefore, uh, we need a basic income that would no provide an income uh, independently of work. That's the argument. And then, of course, you wonder, yes, these people who get an income without work, uh, there is nothing left for them to do. Uh, what are they going to do? Uh, however, However, this is not at all my argument or uh, the argument of any sensible person in favor of an unconditional basic income. What is an unconditional basic income? It's an income that's distributed to every member of a particular society uh, in an unconditional way in three distinct senses. First, it's strictly individual, so that no need to come and check with whom you live and um, whether you are married or not in order to determine whether you are entitled to it. First, uh, notion of inconditionality that's part of the definition of a basic income. Second, uh, unconditionality, it's given to you irrespective of the income from other sources. So it's given to the rich as well as to the poor. 
no reason to come and check how much you've earned or how much you are expected to earn uh, during the current year. And third unconditionality is given to you irrespective of your willingness to work. So no need to check whether you are able to work, willing to work in order to determine whether you are entitled to it. Now, think about these last two conditions, where the universality, uh, so the, the idea that it's given to you whether you are rich or poor, that amounts to a freedom to say yes to jobs, because you keep this income, you keep this benefit, if you get earnings from another source. That is a systematic subsidy to jobs that may be badly paid or irregularly paid or not paid at all, like internships, but which you will only accept if they make sense to you, if they are important for you for all the reasons and the pay they provide in an immediate sense. It may be because of the training they provide, it may be because it enables them to, it enables you to, to realize your passion. It, uh, it's also something that has been described as uh, a venture capital for the people. It enables you to take the risk of doing something you really care about. So that's also uh, the universal aspect and the fact that there is no means that test is what enables you to say yes to some jobs to which you can't say yes now. And of course the obligation freeness, uh, the last unconditionality I mentioned, is what enables you to say no to certain jobs, to say well I'm uh, working under an awful boss, uh, a job that doesn't teach me anything, terrible uh, daily uh, schedules, so I'm going to give it up in order to do something else. because. Uh, it's not in order to lie on your back for the rest of your life, but precisely because it's also a subsidy to a number of activities, you have other options than just working for uh, this uh, particular boss. So that's what a basic income does and what it is and what relevance does it then have to the story which I mentioned before? Well, of course, labor-saving technology combined with globalization has an impact on the labor market. It doesn't lead to an absolute rarefaction of jobs, but it does m lead to a polarization of earning power. And what a basic income, do, uh, what it does is put under the whole of distribution of income a non-conditional flow, which can be complemented, supplemented by income from other sources. And in this way, it's not the end or the recognition or putting up with uh, the end of the right to work. On the contrary, it's what enables us to maintain or to develop, to spread the right to work in the sense of a real possibility to access paid work, employment for everyone in society, despite all the turmoil we'll be facing, constantly facing through the, uh, the fact that some skills become obsolete, through the fact that some people are more talented than others uh, in relationship to the new technologies, etc. So what it, it's certainly not the end of the right to work in this sense. It's not uh, recognizing that uh, there will be nothing left on some people to do. No, it's enable, enabling more people at the limit, everyone to have something to do in this limited sense of getting access to paid employment. But what in this context, and here I'm going to ask you a question, two questions, um, what in this context of the duty to work. Is there a right, if there is, uh, we keep this possibility uh, to do something, in the sense of the question, uh, but is there a duty to do something? So I'll ask yourself, that will be the first version of the question. Suppose there, are, there is something to do for everyone, in the sense that jobs are available, paid employment is available for everyone. My question to you is, do you think there is a duty to work in the sense of to accept uh, paid employment, uh, to take up paid employment when paid employment is available. So you are going to ask that, uh, to answer that question 
not by raising your hands, but with your voice, right? So I'll first ask uh, all the people who think the answer is yes to say yes when I'll have said one, two, three, right? So be prepared, two seconds to think about the question. So the question is, uh, suppose there is enough paid employment for everyone, is there then a duty for everyone in that society to take up employment and uh, to accept uh, a job if offered? Mm. Who among you think uh, yes? They're going to say yes. One, two, three. Okay. Who among you uh, thinks no? Uh, one, two, three. Okay. Yeah, quite. I heard about 36% of abstention. So try to do better at, uh, for, with the second question. Now there is a second question where the question is: Is there a duty to do something, but in uh, a duty to work in another sense, but where work is no, no longer defined as paid employment, but it is defined as uh, making efforts in order to. Uh, be useful to society, to others, and to the collectivity in some sense, okay? So this is another sense of something to do, right? Suppose there is something to do in that sense. Is there then a duty on everyone in a society uh, to uh, do something in that sense, to do something that is, requires an effort and uh, is useful to others in the community? small or big community. So who th among you think yes? They are going to say yes. One, two, three. Yes. Ooh. Um, and who among you thinks no? One, two, three. No. Okay, so the majority was clearly in the other direction, but with a significant no in the second case. Well, uh, let me state my own view about that, which is that clearly what a basic income does is uh, lift the obligation to perform paid work of or reduce it because, of course, how much leeway you'll have to turn down uh, pay, uh, paid employment will depend on the level of that basic income. And so it will never be a basic income that's so comfortable that you'll be able to live in the best uh, uh, Berlin hotel for the rest of your life. Okay, so there will always be uh, something to be gained if uh, you took, on, uh, took up uh, paid employment. But a basic income, and the higher the basic income is, the more freedom it gives you to not to work in this narrow sense. But, and it's essential, it's essential because uh, it's essential, this obligation freeness, because that's what gives greater real freedom to the people with least of it. It gives bargaining power to the people who have least bargaining power. So this obligation freeness is really very important. But at the same time, it doesn't exonerate anyone, on the contrary, of the duty to be useful to others. Of course, this needs to be understood as an ethical duty, a moral duty. I'm personally certain that there cannot be a good society, there can even be a good life without this ethos of contribution to society. But of course, this contribution, Adam, can take very different forms. And it can take, in many, many cases, it does take the form of paid employment, but it can also take the form of all sorts of form of uh, voluntary work. And if anything, the availability of basic income, because it broadens the range of ways in which you can be useful to society, feel you are useful to society by doing a meaningful job or by going for some time for volunteer activities, by broadening that range, in fact, it makes that duty and the moral sanctions associated with it more legitimate that, than would otherwise be the case. Especially if the introduction of a basic income is combined with the two other main components of my own utopia of a better world. And these two other components are related to some of the things that have been discussed today. Uh, one of them is um, what's sometimes called lifelong blended learning. And what it means is this, I mean, the younger generations may complain rightly about all sorts of things, in, including the fact that for our world to be sustainable, they'll have to put up with less material consumption than how uh, our generation has irresponsibly indulged in. Uh, but on the other hand, 
the younger generation is so incredibly richer in terms of access to information than we were when uh, uh, we were their age. And so what's uh, the treasure of information, of knowledge huh, that is available through the internet, cheaply, free of charge in most cases, is out of proportion, completely out of proportion compared to the information we had available uh, earlier in uh, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, etc. But this massive knowledge or this massive of information is something that must not then overwhelm us, uh, drown us, uh, suffocate us. And it's important that this online learning and that uh, from scientific articles, uh, open source scientific articles, all the, all the way to Wikipedia or even the daily news, all this must be appropriated both in a critical and in a creative way, uh, so that you don't just replicate, you don't just uh, 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 let uh, uh, fake news proliferate or contribute to that proliferation, etc. And so you need, at the local level, in all sorts of ways, uh, from university seminars to intergenerational family groups, etc., you need this sort of uh, critical and creative appropriation of this mass of knowledge. That's uh, the second component in addition to basic income. And the third component uh, of crucial importance is what we do with our public spaces. Our public spaces must be reconquered. Uh, the, they have been invaded, dominated by cars. The cars came into it, our, our public spaces as curiosities and then gradually, without our really being, uh, becoming aware, being aware of it, they became absolute calamities. Our public spaces must be uh, spaces that are used for the sake of mobility, uh, but even sustainable mobility must not be the absolute priority. Our public spaces must also be places of, uh, of enjoyable immobility. There must be those places where people are able to meet, to create, uh, to know each other, to overcome the, the, the distrust there may be uh, between them in order to be able to cooperate, to collaborate, and to, uh, be, to show solidarity towards each other. And these three components are really complementary. We need the restructuring of the distribution of income through fitting under the whole of the distribution of income this unconditional income. Uh, we need this uh, sort of lifelong learning throughout through this combination of online learning and local appropriation in groups of, of very different sorts. And we need this, uh, this reconquest of our public spaces, especially in our cities. So in that world, in that sort of world, of course, there will be plenty of things that for people to do uh, and which they'll discover and be enabled to do through the combination of these three elements. But of course, we are not uh, in that world yet, and precisely because we are not in that world yet, there, is, there are even more things to do in order to bring, to bring about that sort of world. So today there are only, I think, uh, 240 minutes left that are usable, so let's not waste time and carry on with it.